Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's session on the book of Nahum and Habakkuk. So even before we could begin with our session, we can start our session with a word of prayer. Can I request one of us to please uh, lead us in prayer? Father, we want to thank you for this time. We submit ourselves to your presence, Lord. Speak to us through your word and help us to understand the mysteries of your word. Bless us together as a class. Also, um, lead Pastor Diana to um, uh, understand, um, to make us understand regarding the mysteries of your word, God. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. So even before I get started, I'll just share the presentation. Okay, everyone can see the presentation. Yeah. So the book of Nahum is a prophet, and the book was written by Nahum himself. It was written in about 600 BC. And uh, to see the background of uh, Nahum, is, he's from a very small village on the banks of... Uh, a river called Tigris, no, at uh, Elkos. So some have attributed this place as a small village in Galilee where Jesus ended up for part of his ministry as well. And some have even said, I mean, few scholars have even said that it would be Capernaum. But we have no evidence about this particular hometown of this ma uh, minor prophet. Well, his name Nahum means comforter in Hebrew. Aside from his hometown, the meaning of his name, um, we don't know much about this prophet. And as per his word comforter, we see in this book that he is comforting. Uh, his name means comfort and he is comforting uh, the people of Israel and also the people of Israel. Yeah. And uh, the little bit background about Nahum. Assyrian, to whom we see in last class, we so spoke about uh, the, uh, the place of Nineveh, where Jonah went and preached uh, to this place where, uh, you know, it was approximately 150 to 200 years before from the time Nahum is writing this book, uh, where uh, we went through this book of Jonah, where Jonah went and preached to Nineveh, and he asked them to turn over from their sin. And we also so, saw that uh, though it was a Gentile nation, uh, the people received Jonah's message for a surprise which even Jonah never thought that they would accept his message and turn and repent and ask God to forgive them. But then for the surprise of Jonah and others, uh, this people of Nineveh accepted the message of repentance and they repented. They repented to God and God forgave them. You know, God, uh, you know, had mercy and did not destroy this nation uh, like that. But Later, much later, after the king would have gone and now a different king has risen, uh, uh, reigned and, you know, it's about 150 to 200 years, Assyrian later came and captured the northern part of Israel. Now they have captured them and they started torturing the people of Israel. They are tortured in such a way that they used to whip Israelites. And then some scholars say that they have, they have ripped the skin, the human skin of people, and they have dried that skin on the wall. So God has been watching over this. God has, uh, then God uh, raised Nahum to go, go with a message to Assyrians saying that, I'm not going to spare you. I'm going to destroy you. Yes, I heard you 150, 200 years back. I forgave you when you repented. But this time, what you have done to my people is not right. So God is sending Nahum towards Assyria, saying that this time I'm not going to spare you. I'm not going to spare you. Well, the very purpose of this book, let's see the purpose of this book. One second, please.
here. We see the purpose, uh, the purpose of this book to announce Nineveh's doom, but in a larger sense to affirm that God punishes all sin. No matter who they are, God punishes their sin. Even when it was Israel, when Israel was sinning against God, God allowed Assyrians to come and, you know, capture Israelites. Now, when Assyrians are sinning, God punishes all sin. Though he is slow to anger, we see that in Nahum chapter 1, verse 3, this is one of the key words that God is slow to anger, but he will not let the wickedness go unpunished. And there are two points here we see that to affirm God's sovereign control over history, Nineveh's destruction was not coincidence or simply the transition from one human empire to another, but it was the direct result of God's judgment. And then we see to assure the Judah that God cares for his own. He's a comforter. God is comforting Judah saying that I am the Lord who is with you. The, the people who believed in the true God, who seeked him, who cried out to him, God shows mercy. This also reminds us that when people of Israel were in slavery in Egypt, God heard their cry. God heard their cry and God raised Moses to deliver them. So time and again, we see whenever God's children looked up to God and they cried out, they repented and they cried out, God has been their savior. God has been there to deliver them, to save them, to rescue them. The same God is now here. When uh, when uh, when uh, people cried out un with the unbearable, uh, with the Assyrians' rule and uh, their act towards Israelites, and they cried out to God, they repented and they cried out. And your God sends Nahum to Assyria, saying that this time your your destruction is sure. This time God is going to judge you, and you can never escape. And there are. The unique features in this book that Nahum is a major source of information concerning the destruction of Assyria and other prophets focusing on the doom of particular nation, which includes Isaiah. Okay, and yes, Isaiah shared about the Assyrian and Babylon, and Jeremiah also shared about Babylon, Obadiah about Edom, Zephaniah about Judah, Ezekiel about Egypt, and Daniel about. Babylon and Persia. And uh, we see Nahum and Obadiah were the only Old Testament prophet who pronounced doom on a pagan nation without also mentioning the sin of Israel. Nahum documents the cruelty of Assyria, which has been called the arc villain of the Old Testament, more ruthless by far than Israel's other force. So this is very important. The unique feature of this book that, you know, we see is, we see that, you know, God raised Nahum to go speak to this Gentile nation of the cruel act, what they're doing. And there are some key verses that we can focus here before we could go to the chapter wise study. We see that uh, from chapter one to two, we see, uh, you know, there's a decree. There's a degree about the destruction of Nineveh has been stated in chapter one, almost uh, chapter one to second chapter of verse one. And then from chapter two, we see that chapter two to three, we see that uh, uh, the, uh, the described destruction of Nineveh, how it will be described. And then chapter three, we see that deserved, that destruction of Nineveh is deserved. And there are some great principles uh, of divine judgment has been stated in chapter one. And in chapter two, we see the call to the battle. Descri uh, description of the destruction of Nineveh has been mentioned. And in chapter three, we see the reason for the destruction of Nineveh. And uh, what God will do has been stated in the first chapter. It's a decree that God is decreeing certain things over the land of Nineveh, the nation of Nineveh. And um, in chapter two, we see how it's been described, how God will do it. And in chapter three, in chapter two, it's been described how God will do it. And in chapter three, uh, you know, it says why God will do it, that Nineveh deserves this destruction. Nineveh deserves this judgment upon them. We'll see that. And there are some key verses here that in Nahum chapter 1, verse 3, it says, The Lord is slow to hunger and great in power, and the Lord 
will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. In whirlwind and storm in his way, and clouds are the dust beneath his feet. Yes, God sent Jonah to forgive Nineveh when they repented. God never judged them at that period of time. But then, but then, because God is slow to anger. But then later when they captured the northern part of Israel and they started torturing Israelites, God will not watch over his people being uh, uh, tormented. He will judge the nation. He will be there to rescue his children. And in Nahum 1.7, we see that the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows who take refuge in him. And then one nine says, whatever they plot against the Lord, he will bring to an end. Trouble will not come a second time. And in 15, the verse, first chapter, verse 15, it says, Behold, on the mountains, the feet of him who brings good news, who announces peace, celebrates your feast, O Judah, pay your vows, for never again will the wicked one pass through you. He is cut off completely. This verse has also been repeated in Matthew, saying that, um, you know, the feet of him who brings the good news is beautiful. And in chapter 2, verse 2, we see that the Lord will restore the splendor of Jacob like the splendor of Israel. Though, though destroyers have laid them waste and have ruined their veins, God will be there for his children. So with this, we will see what this book teaches us. We see that in uh, in chapter one, in chapter one, there is an introduction from uh, verse one to eight. There's an introduction and verse nine to 15, we see the rest of the poems that goes back and forth, constructing the fate of the arrogant, the violent nation, that God will judge them because God is a faithful God and he will judge this people and God will bring down all the arrogant empires who will come against Israel and he will provide refuge for those those who humble themselves before him. Now, 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 this is what we can see. Sorry. Uh, when he describes the downfall of these Assyrians, he uses Isaiah's language about the fall of Babylon. In, in verse 15, what we read through, not only that Nahum also describes the downfall of the Assyrian and good news for the remnant of God's people, but he also directly says a direct, uh, Isaiah's good news about the downfall of Babylon. And so we see that all these little details that is uh, mean mentioned in chapter one they all come together to make a key point for nahum that the fall of nineveh is being presented as an example as an image of how god is at work in history in every age so how we won't allow the arrogant or uh, the violent empires of our world to endure forever because God is a God of righteous. He will judge the people, especially who torments to his people, to his children. When his children cries out to the Lord, a God is a God who answers. From the beginning till now, we see a God will answer us. God will never leave us away to, uh, to the wicked nation, to the arrogant nation who will come and invade us. But when we cry out to God, when we repent, when the Israelites turn back from all the wicked ways and seek God, God will be like the God of, uh, uh, you know, in the, in the prodigal son. We see how the father awaits for the son to repent and come back. God is a God with the same kind of heart, with a heart of love, looking, uh, earnestly looking for his children to turn and come back. That's why in uh, Nahum chapter 1, he says, uh, though uh, chapter 1, 3, he says, the Lord is slow to anger and great in power. And the Lord will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. He will never allow the other nations who come against and uh, uh, torture Israel. He will never leave them unpunished. Who can stand against God? Who can stand against God of Israel? So this is just not the history. Even now, if you see, God is mindful of Israel. 
who can stand against us right okay. time and again it's just not only in the bible times we see that god is on behalf of israel but even now we see god his for israel one of the newspapers uh, sometime back i read when there was a uh, war happening clashes happening between the other neighboring nations and israel uh, there was a very beautiful beautiful image where the president or uh, yeah the president or the leader of the other nation uh, they they having this tug of war tug of war okay uh, pulling israel at the one side and this side israel pulling the uh, rope okay and one side i saw there's a finger finger like this at the rope and they have captioned it who can stand against god against the god of israel can anyone no matter how powerful technology we are in no matter what powerful weapon each one can create and come up but can they fight against god the god who stood with israel then is the same god who is standing with each of us not only for israel even for us as we are because we seek him we worship him So in chapter two we see it describes the battle of Nineveh and overthrow the city in the progressive stages. So first we see the front line of uh, Babylonian soldiers and then we see about the charge of the chariots and then we see the chaos that is happening in the city wall as the city is breached. Then we see the slaughters of Nineveh's people, the plundering of the city. So as this has been described. We'll move on to chapter three, where it says, "Yes, Nineveh deserves this." So, as we uh, go on to describe the result of the city uh, city's downfall for the empire as a whole, in chapter three, verse one, we see Nahum begins by announcing a woe upon the city, whose kings built in with the blood of the innocent. So it's an image of how an injustice was built into the very system that made Assyrian yes successful before, but now their violence has sown the seed of their own destruction. So what we sow is what we reap. So Assyrian will fall before Babylonian. God has raised Babylonian to capture Assyria and bring a fall to them. but later at the same time god is not allowing the babylonian to capture israel and you know wait for they'll do but god will come against the babylonian as well we will see in the next book the book concludes with a taunt against the fallen king of assyria and he strikes with a fatal wound and from among all the nations that he once oppressed no one comes to help him rather they sing and celebrate you know the israelites sing and celebrate we read in uh, chapter 3 verse 19 can i request one of us to please turn to nahum chapter 3 verse 19 chapter 3 verse 19 there is no relief for your breakdown your wound is incurable all who care about you will clap their hands over you for on whom has not your evil passed continually yes thanks thank you john so this is what it is so in verse 19 we see that the israelites celebrate they sing and celebrate at the destruction of assyria and that's how this book ends yes it is a very gloomy about you know the, where it, it talks about the decree about the downfall of downfall of nineveh and then uh, the second chapter talks about describes about how they fall and lastly the third chapter says yes assyrian deserve this deserve this god's judgment is a good news for us upon um upon uh, nineve so we see that in chapter 1 verse 7 uh, we read that the lord is good and a refuge in the day of distress in the day of trouble and he knows those who take refuge in him when we see god is a god who is a good god god is a good god always he has been good from the very beginning of the earth till now a god is a good god and he is a refuge in time of trouble when we see god he is our refuge god who fought for his people with nineveh 
with the Assyrians. It's the same God who will fight for us. So we, how we can, what we can learn from this book is no matter what we have done, where we are, no matter how dark times that we are in or the surrounding nation, what persecution we may go through, we may hear a lot of persecutions for Christians around us or we may be one of the victims in it. But then the Lord is comforting us through Nahum saying that he is a God, a comforter. God will not be watching over us when we go through difficult time. But then God has been a God who will fight our battle when we seek him. Even in the dark time, God is saying, I am a God who is faithful. I will rescue you. I will be with you. I will strengthen you and I will rescue you. And God, uh, by his word, through this book, he encourages us that he will fight our battle. The battle does not belong to you. The battle belongs to me. All we have to do is seek God. Seek God and be strengthened in him. And God will fight our battle. So with this, we can move on to the next book. The book of Habakkuk. So who wrote this book? This book is named after Habakkuk itself. He wrote this book in uh, 612 to 588 BC. And the text would have been written around the same time or on the span of uh, the time of Daniel was taken into captive in ba Babylon, maybe in 605 BC. So in 597 BC, Ezekiel would also be taken captive in Babylon. So it's all in the same time with few years difference, but all this is happening badly. So Habakkuk is an unusual name in Hebrew, which is derived from the verb called Habak, means embrace. So here we see that, you know, all these prophets have a name with a, a meaning added to it. So when we see the name probably means one who embraces or clings. So the end of this book also, we see that his name is appropriate with this book. That Habakkuk chooses, um, you know, he chooses to cling firmly to God. Regardless of what is happening around him and his nation. We see that in his last chapter, chapter 3, verse 16 to 19. How he says, uh, can I request anyone to please turn to chapter 3, verse 16 to 19, please? I heard and my inward parts tremble at the sound of my lips quivered. Decay enters my bones and in my place I tremble because I must wait quietly for the day of distress for the people to arise who will invade us. Though the fig tree should not blossom and there be no fruit on the vines, though the yield of the olive should fail and the fields produce no food, though the flock should be cut off from the fold and there be no cattle in the stalls, yet I will exult in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord is my strength and he has made my feet like his feet and makes me walk on my high places for the choir director on my string instruments. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, John. So this has also been the one of the key verses in this book that we can carry it, that God will strengthen us and he will make our feet like the hymn speed that we can climb on heights, tread on heights. So uh, here we see how Habakkuk, Sorry, sorry, some disturbance myself, sorry. Yeah, so here we see that Habakkuk, you know, literally clings on to God. And he says, he says very firmly that God, regardless of what happens around me, I cling on to you because only you can strengthen me. And as he clings to God, we see that God replies 
to Habakkuk saying, uh, you know, yes, Habakkuk, my people have hard hearted people. OK, so Habakkuk is asking God, how long this intolerable condition can continue here? When Habakkuk asked this to God, we see there's a lot of conversation happens like uh, unlike the book of Job and yeah, there's a conversation between God and Habakkuk. So God replies to Habakkuk saying that the Babylonians will be his chastening rod upon the nation. So I will send Babylon to conquer Assyrian and announce that sends a prophet to his knees. So this made um Habakkuk to get on knees and pray and he acknowledges that the righteous in any generation shall live by faith and not by sight. So this is one of the key verses as well. We'll go to the key verses of this book so it becomes easy for us to study this book. Yeah, Habakkuk 2, verse 4. We see that the enemy is puffed up, his desires are not upright, but the righteous person will live by his faithfulness. The other version says the righteous shall live by faith. So this is what it is uh, that we can concentrate on the book of Habakkuk, where uh, God is asking Habakkuk to go and uh, proclaim to each and everyone in the nation saying that uh, God will judge them. Uh, you know, Habakkuk asked God why he, uh, in chapter one, okay, in chapter one, he asked God why he seems to delay the judgment against this wicked nation, okay, Assyria. And the Lord is raising up the Chaldeans, their horses, also, uh, you know, uh, uh, swift like leopards and more fierce than evening. Also. He describes this like a poetic form and all these. And he says they gather the captives like sand, scoffing at kings and princes. So when the Babylonians come to the land of Judah and uh, they will wrongly give the credit to their false God. And Habakkuk wonders why God would use a nation which is much more wicked than Judah to bring judgment on Judah. Well, Habakkuk stands and um, though he is not able to understand because sometimes we cannot comprehend what God is thinking. So we need to wait and watch like what Habakkuk did for God to reply to Habakkuk. So we see in chapter 2, God replies to Habakkuk and he and he writes down saying that. Uh, can I request one of us to read Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4 please? Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4. Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. Yes. So the proud are not upright, but the just shall live by faith. So we see that the Babylonian as in greedy, they desire for the conquest, but they shall be plundered by the remnant of those they owe to the greedy. God says, owe to the greedy, owe to the violent. They are drunkard, they are idolatrous. But the Lord in his holy temple, let all the earth keep silence before him. So yes, God allowed the Babylonians to come over to capture Assyrians. God raised a Babylonian as a rod to, you know, conquer Assyria. But then it does not mean that God will leave Judah to Babylonian. But there is a way. God will rescue his people because God is mindful of his people. So in chapter 3, we see that Habakkuk pleads for revival. So here we see there's a song of praise uh, which says like uh, Psalms, he says, Seller, glorifying God's power over the earth and the nation. So Habakkuk is afraid yet resolves to rejoice in the Lord. Can I request one of us to uh, read chapter 3 verse 19 from the book of Habakkuk? The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights for the director of music on my strings instruments. Amen. Amen. Yes. So the Lord God is our strength. He will make our feet like the deer's feet and he will make us walk on high hills. So uh, it seemed like that. 
not only then in Habakkuk's time, but even in our time. We can apply this verse even to ourselves today. And we also see there's a chief musician with stringed instrument rising to praise God and you know to glorify God, just like how the psalm, uh, just like how Psalmist David did, Habakkuk also is doing. And what we can learn from the book of Habakkuk today is that God already knew the thoughts in Habakkuk's heart, but Habakkuk only received an answer when he took his questions to God. And God did respond because our God is a God who answers to us. He loves to communicate to us. And we see when Habakkuk asked many questions to God and God responded with a promise and a reminder of his sovereignty. We must also recognize that the promise remains true for us today. So whatever the promise that God gave Habakkuk, in the same way, the situation uh, is almost the same what Habakkuk went through and we are going through. So we can relate to these promises that what God gave Habakkuk and we can also relate it to us. So there was one of the victory that came and the same victory awaits our world today in his timing. We need to trust and wait like how Habakkuk waited on God so that, you know, we can understand God better. To trust God fully means to trust him even when we do not understand why events are occurring around us, what will happen, what will happen to the so many uh, Christians have been persecuted, they are dying around us. There are no answers at times for the things that are happening around us. But then we need to wait on God, just like how Habakkuk waited. And he encourages us, the righteous person, the just person shall live by faith. We need to wait on God because a God who never gave up on his people before, the same God will never give up on us. He is a faithful God. He is a God on whom we can trust and wait on. And there are some uh, uh, portrayal shadow of Christ here is through the word of salvation. Can I request one of us to please turn to chapter 3 verse 13 and the other person can take up chapter 3 verse 18. And uh, the third verse is chapter 2 verse 14. Chapter 3 verse 13. You went forth for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. You struck the head of the house with evil. Uh, uh, you struck the head of the house of the evil to lay him open from thigh to neck. Yeah. Can anyone read verse eighteen, please, and then chapter chapter two, verse fourteen. Verse 18 from Habakkuk chapter 3. Yet I will have joy in the Lord and I will be glad in the God who saves me. Thank you, brother. Can anyone read Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 14. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Amen. Thank you so much. So we see that the word salvation appears three times in these scriptures. That is chapter 3, verse 13 and 18, and later in chapter 2, verse 14. So which is the root word from which the name Jesus is derived. We see in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. So when he comes again, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the water covers the sea. So we see the portrayal of Christ through the word called salvation in this book. So one word that we can encourage ourselves as we uh, uh, as we look into the key verses is uh, in uh, in Habakkuk chapter one verse five we see look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed for I am going to do something in our days that you would not believe even if we were to. Can one of us read each key verses, please? Can we read from the PPT? Or... All right. Uh, Habakkuk 1 verse 5. Look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed. For I am going to do something in your days that you would not believe 
even if you were told can each one take up each verse and read please have a cook two two to three write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets so that a herald may run with it for the revelation awaits an appointed time it speaks to the end end and will not prove false though it linger wait for it it will certainly come and will not delay 24 see the enemy is puffed up his desires are not upright but the righteous person will live by his faithfulness amen yes the next verse please was uh, chapter 3 was 17 and 18 though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes in the vines though the olive crops fail and the fields produce no food though there are no sheep in the pen or no cattle in the stalls yet i will rejoice in the lord will be joyful in god my sa- my savior was 19 the sovereign lord is my strength he makes my feet like the feet of a deer he enables me to tread on the heights amen thank you so much so one verse that stands out and i would like to highlight it here or talk about it is uh, chapter 2 verse 2 to 3 write down the revelation and make it plain on the tablets so that a herald that is a time may come to run with it for the revelation waits an appointed time it speaks of the end and will not prove false though it linger that is do it tabby wait for it it will certainly come and will not delay so one thing that we can learn from the scripture is write down your vision whatever vision whatever desire that god has put in each of our heart maybe far from reality a far from our strength that it can happen but then god is encouraging us through the book of habakkuk to please write it down and though it may tarry though it may delay though it may delay but it will come to pass when we wait on god wait on it when it comes to pass and we can read over it and remember yes this is what god put in my heart and we waited and god has brought it to pass so this is something that you know many prophets many leaders have followed they have written the desire they've written the vision what god has put in their heart and they prayfully waited on god to fulfill the things in his time and when we write it down with uh, you know the just shall live by faith when we live in faith when we prayfully wait on god in time god will bring that vision to pass and we can all glorify god in that so now i leave the class open where you can share your learning from the book of nehem and from the book of habakkuk like how god spoke to you what are the scriptures verses that has encouraged you so you can uh, share at this time from the book of nehem uh, chapter 1 was 3 the second part uh, it stand it stood out for me um recently while i was praying so this this says um in uh, in whirlwind and storm is his way and clouds are the dust beneath his feet a reminder to all of us to you know we, we can continue to trust god because he has ways even in the midst of storms and from the book of habakkuk uh, as we read as uh, screen, key scriptures and the uh, chapter 3 was 19 the lord god is my strength and he makes my feet like a deer's feet and makes me walk on um, this uh, word there my high places so everyone's challenge is different everyone's high places are different but he enables us to tread upon that individually in 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 true thank you so much john for highlighting the scriptures where we can apply it in our own situation in our life thank you so much anyone else in the class would like to share
Okay, as you're preparing yourself to share, I would like to let you know tomorrow we can have two classes that is from 10 to 11 and 11 to 12 we can have so that we can complete the last four chapters in those two hours tomorrow. Is that okay? Are you all available tomorrow? 10 to 12? Yes, ma'am. Yes, Is it okay with everyone in the class? Great. So that we can complete it tomorrow itself, the last four books of the Minor Prophets, and we will be completing the Old Testament. Yes, it is okay, Pastor. Thank you, Brother Lubega, for confirming. So tomorrow, 10 to 11 and 11 to 12. So next two hours, we will have second and third hour tomorrow. Okay, anyone would like to share uh, your learnings or uh, some promises that you claim from these two books, Book of Nahum and Book of Habakkuk? So please feel free to share before we could dismiss end the session. Uh, Pastor, I really love this uh, uh, Habakkuk. Most of the verses, uh, especially the 317 to 19, uh, it has been a great um, encouragement, um, uh, which especially verse 19 when it says like, he makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. There's a, actually a book uh, called Hind's Feet on High Places based on this verse, which is really awesome uh, how she explains uh, the Christian walk. Uh, uh, so it's written by Hannah Hernard. Um, and it's just a very uh, great book. And also Habakkuk uh, chapter 2, verse 2 to 3, where it says, write down the revelation and make it plain on the tablet so that a herald may run with it. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. Uh, uh, this verse actually spoke to me, um, really, uh, whatever God... <laughs> Uh, you know, reveals through his word, you know, encouraged me to write down, you know, the, in a journal, uh, whatever God is putting in my heart. Uh, God has lots to speak each day, right? Uh, when we sit at his presence, of course, he puts things in our spirit. So, yeah, uh, really love those verses, how, uh, how it is uh, to really think, visualize it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Divya. Thank you, everyone, for sharing. Yes, these are the scriptures, which is very important. Yes, um, yes, especially Habakkuk chapter 2, 2 to 3. Write down your vision is very important. I would encourage all of us, uh, yes, in different stages, we will have different vision, different desire, which God puts in our heart. But I would encourage each one of us to write down, just like how Habakkuk has said, and there will be a time, though it's tearing, it will not get delayed, but God who's put that desire will bring it to pass in due time. And also, Chapter 3, verse 17 to 19 is a very important verse. Though we may see the failures all around us, but the God is faithful. We need to rely on his strength. And when we rely on him, when we seek him, yes, the sovereign Lord is our strength. That's a very beautiful declaration which we can declare over ourselves. That he makes our feet like the feet of a deer and he enables us to tread on heights. Heights, it can be anything the heights or highway or mountain. The Bible describes a difficult situation in many uh, poetic form, but then it means the same in any difficult situation. God can strengthen us when we rely on him and his strength can make us an overcomer, just like how Paul writes, we are more than an overcomer. He makes our feet like the hen's feet that enables us to tread on heights, which we would not have done without his strength, without his enablement. So we can rely on God in many difficult situations that we come across in our life. So we can claim and learn from these scriptures and apply it in our life. So, yeah, before we could uh, end, can I request one of us to lead us in prayer? I mean, to pray before we dismiss this class, please. Can I request Brother Lyndon to dismiss us with a word of prayer, please? Sure, Pastor. Uh, 
Dear Lord, thank you uh, for this wonderful day you've given us, Lord. Thank you for bringing us into understanding of these two books, Lord Jesus, Nehum and Habakkuk, Lord Jesus. Thank you for, you've been a jealous God, Lord Jesus, and you, you, you fight for your people, O oh Master. And thank you for all the promises that you've given us, Lord Jesus. Thank you for uh, helping us understand how we need to be in times of crisis situation, Lord Jesus, particularly with respect to Habakkuk 3, 17, 18. Lord Jesus, thank you for giving us hope, Lord Jesus, and you've been there all throughout, Lord Jesus. Thank you for your divine mercy and grace. Thanks for your understanding. Thank you for all the all the, the chapters that we could, you know, get to understand from all, all these months of Master. And why we are preaching the fag end of this course, Lord Jesus, help us to feed on these courses every day, help us to meditate on your word even more as we are in the end of days, Lord Jesus. And the Bible says when where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. Lord Jesus, help us, Lord Jesus, that we grow in your mercy and grace and Lord learn and grow in your word and meditate on your word every day, oh Master God. Thank you for all those who have joined in today. Thanks for the, the pastor who have uh, you know, uh, taught us and brought us into enlightenment of your word, oh God. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this uh, wonderful week and thanks for uh, all those who have joined again for today, Lord Jesus. Help us to meditate on your word for the other uh, uh, rest of the books for tomorrow lord jesus be with us guide us take care of us lord jesus in jesus name we pray amen 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 thank you so much for joining in today's session god bless see you all tomorrow at 10 o'clock okay thank you god bless yes thank you thank you god bless